Welcome back everyone to the Odisha Design Week uh, event and today we have the uh, last speaker for today. Uh, of course, the videos were very uh, wonderful. I mean, it gave us a glimpse of uh, the state Odisha, its culture and uh, also about the Odisha Design Week, the different speakers we've had and we are yet to have. So now we have Sushmita Moh Mohanty. And uh, welcome, Sushmita. We have uh, Sushmita. She is an Indian spaceship designer, serial space entrepreneur, and a climate action advocate. She is well known for her research on space-related topics. She co-founded India's first private space startup, Earth to Orbit, in 2009. She is the only space entrepreneur in the world to have started companies on three different continents in Asia, Europe, and North America. Sushmita is one of the few people to have visited both the Arctic and Antarctic. I welcome Sushmita Mohanty to share her insights, and I'm sure we'll have a lot of takeaway from her. Welcome, Sushmita. Thank you. Thank you, Rashmi. Um, so today I'm going to share with you uh, something that's been a passion since my high school days. And the passion is for designing for environments which are extraterrestrial. So how are we going to live off the planet? How are we going to transport ourselves on these planets? Or for that matter, in low Earth orbit. So what I'll do is I'll start with uh, a set of slides and then I will show you um, a couple of videos. 
So let's get started. I'm going to share my screen with you. Just give me a second. Yeah. So Rashmi, can you see my screen uh, clearly? Yes. Okay. It's fine. Well, yeah. So I think what's uh, what has been most exciting for me designing for extraterrestrial environments, uh, there are several things. You know, when we design for living uh, on Earth, we often take a lot of things for granted. Uh, for one, we take gravity for granted. You know, we live in one gravity. We take atmospheric pressure for granted. If there was no atmospheric pressure, you know, our veins would burst. Uh, we also take natural illumination and the electromagnetic spectrum, you know, the colors that we see here on Earth for granted. Let's say if you're on the moon and there's no atmosphere, um, it's, it's pretty much black and white and gray, as you can see in this photograph from one of the Apollo missions. Uh, the, the other important thing to keep in mind is the psychological dimension of living in these hostile environments which is, is, is one of the primary drivers for designers who design habitats or, you know, transporters, um, greenhouses, what have you. So I think what we'll do is we'll start off with, I'll give you a little bit of an idea of my life's trajectory, how it all began. Why did I choose to become um, what I became? I've spent almost 20 plus years in the professional aerospace world of which about 15 years or thereabouts, I have been designing future systems. So habitation systems, transportation systems, exploration systems for outer space. So the pictures that we are looking at here, the two photographs are from pretty much around the same time. It's around 1972. You can see on one side, you have Eugene Cernan, one of the Apollo astronauts, in the during the last Apollo landing, which happened in December of 1972. And that's me in my rover in Ahmedabad. That's the city I grew up in. And back in the day, you can see that the stroller that at least the one I grew up with was quite fantastic. It was almost like a mini habitat. You know, it, it gave you a lot of um, space to play, to be. Uh, when I look at the strollers that kids use these days, I think this kind of a rover was far more exciting to have. So I think this was this was the early 70s. And since then, uh, nobody had landed on the moon until the Chinese did it. So the Chinese have landed on the moon three times, three consecutive times. Each one was a successful landing. And in the most recent landing, they even brought back lunar rocks which is again something that no country had done in the last 44 years. So the last time the Americans landed on the moon was 72. The Russians last landed in 76. It was a robotic mission and the Chinese have landed three times already. And they even had a very successful landing in their first attempt on Mars in February of this year. So just, just so you know, from a technology standpoint, landing or making soft precision landings on planetary surfaces is still a huge challenge. Um, not many countries can do it. I mean, if you remember the Chandrayaan-2 mission where we attempted to land the moon failed, uh, it's, it's a clear example of uh, the, the, the reality that it's still very difficult uh, for us to land successfully on these surfaces. The other very important thing in my uh, early part of my life's trajectory is I had a very gender, gender neutral upbringing. So one of the themes for this uh, series of talks is culturally connected. Uh, my parents are from Odessa and I think I grew up in an environment, not just at home, uh, but also in my neighborhood, in the city I was in, um, in, a, in a way which was uh, very open to new ideas. Um, I could talk about art, architecture, design, technology very freely. There were no constraints as such. And I think that did play a very big role in, you know, in my formative years, in, in shaping my mind and in, in shaping me as a person. 
So what you're seeing here are two photographs from the 60s. On the left, you're looking at a rocket nose cone uh, of a sounding rocket, so a smaller rocket, being carried on a bicycle in Thumba in Kerala, in the south of India. And these were the very early days. Uh, so many people don't know that the Indian space program is almost as old as some of the world's oldest programs. And um, we did our first experimental rocket launch in November of 1963. So if you remember, Sputnik flew in 1957, Yuri Gagarin went up in 1961, India did its first experimental rocket launch in 1963, just to kind of give you a time scale here. And India also happens to be one of five or six countries. Um, I, I would say India is easily in the top five or six spacefaring countries in the world. If you look at our space capabilities, and also the budget. There are very few nations in the world which have launching capability, which have rockets, and India is one of them. On the right hand side, you see another beautiful black and white photograph. It's a TV grab of the first Apollo landings, you know, in the 60s. So I grew up with, um, you know, pioneers of the Indian space program. I grew up with material, you know, my, my father used to um, live in Germany for four years before he came back and was hired by Sarabhai uh, to work for the new space program. He was also in Canada for some time as part of our uh, space program. So I think one of my childhood memories is, you know, looking at these beautiful slides on a Kodak projector at home. And one of those set of slides were from the Apollo landing that my father had seen on television while he was living in Canada. You're looking at a couple of pictures again from Ahmedabad. Um, not only was I amidst uh, scientists and engineers working for the space program in Ahmedabad, I was also surrounded by amazing architects and patrons of architecture and children of architects. You know, Ahmedabad is, a, is at least used to be uh, you know, primarily there were these industrial families who had cotton mills. So there were many cotton mill owner families in Ahmedabad. And they would patronize contemporary architects and invite them to build not only private residences, but also public buildings. So to name a few, we had B.V. Doshi, we had Charles Correa, we had Corbusier, we had Louis Kahn. And I grew up in this milieu where architecture, space, and all forms of, I mean, this was part of the cultural fabric of Ahmedabad. Um, and I mean, I, I love to say that I grew up in Sarabhai Ahmedabad, which is very different from what Ahmedabad is today, if you ask me. And I grew up in a neighborhood which was right next to I am Ahmedabad, School of Architecture, Atira, um, Space Application Center, PRL. And I could bicycle to all of these places. You know, back then there were no cars. I grew up in the 70s and 80s. So I would easily bicycle to some of the most fantastic libraries, not just in India, anywhere in the world. And back then there was no, no security as such. You could just take your bicycle in and actually go and use some of these libraries. I often feel that the fact that we have internet today um, the younger generation is definitely empowered, but I think that's also brings in an inertia to not go out and seek things and people in ways that we did without the internet. So I think Ahmedabad as a city had some of the finest institutions within a very small radius. And that's something uh, which played to my advantage, if you ask me. Um, and, and the, the fact that there were these amazing libraries within the industry. And I, I would also seek out very interesting pe people that I wanted to go and talk to about ideas or if I had questions, which is something I don't see young people doing as much anymore. So I would like to encourage all of you young people out there who are listening to this talk to do that. Get off your computers, go out, meet people, talk to people especially people who could be, you know, you could be discussing your ideas with or getting feedback from. So I grew up wanting to be what I back then used to call a zero gravity designer. 
Uh, when you're in low Earth orbit, it's microgravity, so it's near zero gravity, not exactly zero gravity. There's a tiny bit of gravity, but it's it's called microgravity. So I used to call I used to say that I want to be a zero gravity designer. And in high school, I would work on imaginary problems of living and working in microgravity. Everything from say microgravity restraint systems, like how would you restrain yourself in gravity while you're working and and um, you know you want to stay still, to uh, toilets in microgravity, to habitats, and I would send my ideas to you know wherever I thought people were working on it. It could be a university, it could be NASA, it could be the European Space Agency, and I would do this just by you know by post by Indian post. Uh, postal service. And for every 10 letters I would write, I would hear back from two or three sources. And that was enough encouragement for me to keep going on. So those years were wonderful. I think I think snail mail works even today. Um, so I encourage people, especially younger people, to not stop writing and reaching out to people. Um, the other thing I had is I had inherited my dad's portable German typewriter. So I used to type up my projects on that typewriter and I used to draw by hand. And like I said, I would go to libraries and I would find places where they were working on similar ideas or, you know, um, space related design stuff. And I would send it to them. What you're looking at here is my first professional engagement in the sense I was for three months, I was at NASA Johnson in the late 90s. And back then, like it was 1997, so pre 9-11 days, uh, security wasn't a very big concern. And we were batched for all buildings. So I could literally go to every single building at NASA Johnson. We used to go to uh, the mission control in the middle of the night to look at the second Hubble repair mission live. Um, and I have chosen this picture of the space shuttle uh, and the Mir space station. You're looking at the space shuttle Atlantis from one of these big, beautiful windows on the Russian space station Mir. When I was at NASA Johnson, the Americans and the Russians were collaborating or cooperating, and they would send up an American astronaut to spend up to four to six months on the orbiting Mir space station, which was up in orbit for almost 15 years. The Russians really were and are the masters of human spaceflight. I mean, by the time the Americans started sending their astronauts to spend long, you know, long periods of time on the Russian station, some of the Russian cosmonauts had already spent six months. A couple of them had also spent a year in outer space. And those are the real, real life tests of how do we deal with physiology and psychology uh, of living in such confined environments, you know, in, in outer space for long periods of time. Uh, what I love about this picture is the fact that the Russians use a beautiful mechanical cover. So if you see to the left of the image, you can see the cover, which is open here. So the, the, the windows on Mir space station, even by the time it was deorbited in uh, 2001, were in pristine condition. And uh, space, if you look at the bottom of the photograph, somewhere in the middle, you see the adapter, the docking adapter. So the Space Shuttle Atlantis had to be outfitted for it to go and dock with me during these um, uh, missions where they would take an American astronaut to the Russian station. Um, the other project that I worked early on in my career was the International Space Station program. So I worked for the Boeing company in Huntington Beach in Southern California. And being a foreign national, normally foreign nationals are not allowed to work for um, companies such as Boeing or SpaceX or Blue Origin. You have to be a US citizen to be working on those sites because space happens to be dual purpose, you know, because a rocket is also a missile. So the site I was working on um, or I was hired to work on, also had a facility where they make Delta rockets. So anyway, it, it, it was, it's a long story, which I won't go, go into here, but it, was, it took them 15 months after deciding to hire me to actually bring me on board. And I was there for three years, and uh, instead of working on design projects because of, uh, you know, security issues, I was asked to work in international business development. 
which in my view was a great inflection point because here I was trained as an engineer, trained as an industrial designer, getting to work in international business development. So what we did for the space station program, my small team of 12 people, we were the international programs office. We would bid for contracts from partners of the space station program. The reason I'm saying this is many of you designers out there are neat to open your minds to the fact that you need to learn business development to be getting new business, new contracts. So bid and proposal is a very, um, it, it's a very routine thing that you would do in aerospace companies. So we would sell anything as small as a fire extinguisher, like a space qualified fire extinguisher, which would probably cost a million, couple of millions of dollars. Up uh, as big, we could, we would even sell something as big as a space station module, which we did to the Japanese. So I learned how to write proposals, how to negotiate proposals, and how to manage international contracts. And that was a fantastic learning experience because then at the end of these three years, I went out and started my first little company in San Francisco, which is in Northern California. And you're looking at the space station here in its near complete or I think complete configuration. And it's roughly the size of two football fields. What you see here, the brown panels, these are the solar panels and the white crinkly panels are the thermal radiators. They pump the heat out of the station and help cool the station. What you see at one end here in the, in the middle is the Soyuz, um, the Soyuz ferry, which can take a crew of three to the space station. Uh, so broadly speaking, this complex is divided into the Russian half and US and allies, the other half, where you have uh, the, the modules are made in the United States in Japan and in Italy. So the European modules are made in Italy and Turin. So this is built by what we call piecemeal architecture. Parts of these are taken on different rocket flights. Some of them were carried up there in the cargo bay of the then space shuttle. The space shuttle fleet of four retired in 2011. So the first module flew in 1998, the year I started working for Boeing. And it took almost 20 years to build the whole thing out. So not only would you need multiple launches to carry these different bits and pieces of the station and plug them in space, you would also need astronauts doing spacewalks to go outside and to connect certain conduits and plumbing on the outside to make this piecemeal uh, station functional. So it needed a combination of EVAs. EVAs are nothing but spacewalks. We call them EVA because extra vehicular activity and rocket launches to be carrying your flight hardware. So I started my little company in San Francisco in the year 2001, and it was called Moonfront. Uh, back then the word startup didn't exist. So I don't quite really like the word startup uh, because we've pretty much um, you know, beaten it to death. So this small company was a boutique consulting firm. We were six partners and we had different interests and we would go out and get projects. And I was into exploration. So most of my projects were to do with human space exploration. Uh, you're looking at one of the renderings um, that came out of a workshop that me and two of my friends from Europe conducted at the European Space Agency Center in the Netherlands. They have four different centers. Uh, the one that does human space flight is called ESTEC. It's based in the Netherlands, not far from Amsterdam. So you're looking at a hybrid moon base. What I mean by hybrid here is it has um, rigid parts, solid parts, and it also has inflatable parts, which are rigidized after they're inflated. And this kind of a moon base um, that you're looking at here would also have to be constructed in the future using piecemeal architecture. And this particular um, concept was created by this team called Copernicus. So you can see that branding on there. Yet another concept, I'm just trying to get you guys stretch, to stretch your imagination and think of what are the possibilities. Uh, so the moon um, has no atmosphere, no running water. So the lunar dust um, in, in many parts of the moon, there's like uh, 
several meters of loose lunar dust. So that because there are no weathering forces, the dust is super sharp and super, super small. And it gets into everything. It gets into the creases of your spacesuit if you're out walking. It gets into the mechanical parts of your moon rover if you're out in a buggy. And if you were to breathe that and bring it inside your habitat, it would go sit in your lungs. And it's very sharp like glass. And apparently it smells like burnt gunpowder. Um, the other problem on the moon is, is not just that the, the dust is treacherous, it gets into everything, uh, is uh, the fact that it doesn't have an atmospheric blanket to protect you from galactic radiation. So there are a couple of ways we could potentially protect ourselves. We could sort of build a bunker, a wall um, of water. We could build a bunker made of regolith, which is nothing but lunar soil. The other idea is to build into lava tubes. So you have these lava tubes. So you can go subterranean and build out your habitat inside one of those tubes. And this particular concept that you're looking, here, looking at here uh, was designed by a team called Team Kepler. And it um, is again a piecemeal, piecemeal architecture um, habitat where the different parts have been brought together and assembled and it's built into a lava tube to protect you from radiation. Often the kind of hardware we design, we have to test them and we test them on Earth um, at what we call analog sites. You're looking at a photograph where a new rover, which you see in the foreground in the bottom part of the picture, and a new kind of spacesuit is being tested underwater in a tank in France, in the south of France, in Marseille. So by being underwater, we are able to simulate one-sixth gravity as you have on the moon. So reduced gravity is what we're trying to achieve here while testing new hardware that's been designed. Um, you're looking at a rendering of a future habitat. Um, and you, you can see the some of the petals of the habitat. So we often take inspiration from nature for, for some of our designs. Because when you fly something on the top of a rocket, uh, either to low Earth orbit or to moon or to Mars, you have a certain volume at the top of the rocket, that is your boundary, that's your, your boundary condition, that's your constraint. You have to design something that can fit in that volume in the rocket fairing. And then once it is, once it reaches the planetary destination, you can then um, deploy it, like open it up and expand it. So what you're looking at here is we worked, my, my company in Vienna, I started another company with a friend in Vienna in 2004, and it's called Liquifer. Uh, that company is still around. We celebrated our 15th anniversary a couple of years ago. So this is one of the concepts that the Vienna company designed or came up with in partnership with five other organizations. And not only did uh, we design the, this particular habitat, it was meant to be for a crew of two astronauts, uh, we, we took inspiration from nature and, you know, that's that field of science is called biomimetics or biomimicry. So the way these petals fold in, they can go on top of a, I'll show you the next picture and you'll see. So that was a rendering. And this is a real prototype that you're looking at in this picture. So the side petals can be folded in and it becomes like a rectangular tube this habitat while being outfitted. So while the furniture and everything is still in there and you can then transport it on top of a lorry, which is like a big truck. Uh, usually this habitat prototype, it sits in a high bay in um, the International Space University in Strasbourg. And it was transported by road to Spain to a place called Rio Tinto, which has a terrain which is similar to Mars so that we could uh, run some simulations, some tests. So the astronaut you see in this picture would be called a simonaut instead of an astronaut because he's part of a simulation. And you see a rover here in the, in, on the left-hand side. So we are testing um, a new habitat here, a rover. Uh, and we are also testing uh, what we call protocols, communication protocols that were designed for the human 
uh, in this system to communicate with the robotic element, which in this case is the rover. So designers not only design hardware, they also design communication protocols, for example. Um, I moved back to India in 2008 and I started my third company, which was called Earth to Orbit. Uh, we spent the first seven years opening up the US launch market for India because in 1998, when India conducted nuclear tests, the US um, imposed an embargo on India, which still exists, by the way. And under this embargo, uh, American companies were not allowed to launch satellites on an Indian rocket. Uh, the other big hurdle that we needed to overcome was uh, something called ITAR. It is an export control regime from the Cold War times, which basically says that anything that's made in the United States, if it has to fly on a foreign rocket, it becomes a defense article. And then you have to go through these bureaucratic processes and get approvals to fly that defense article on the foreign rocket. So it took us three years of soft diplomacy, talking to bureaucrats and diplomats in Washington, D.C. and New Delhi. And at the end of four years, we did manage to get permission to launch the first ever American satellite on um, an Indian rocket. Not, not the first ever American satellite, but to fly on an Indian rocket. The launch agreement was finally signed after five years. And by the time we launched it, it was 2016. And the company that was my launch client, Skybox Imaging, um, a Stanford startup, it was acquired by Google. So we ended up launching a 110 kilogram Google satellite on the PSLV. And we made history because that was the first ever commercial launch agreement between an American company and ISRO's commercial arm. We also helped launch a Japanese satellite on the PSLV. So the objective here was that the Europeans, if they want to launch satellites on the Indian rockets, it's relatively easier because we have good bilateral relations with Europe. But if the PSLV rocket has to have a bigger market, then it, it has to have Americans and Japanese launching on this rocket as well. So we, we kind of tried to help build the market for this Indian rocket. This is a photograph that, um, uh, it's, uh, it's a photograph of a crew capsule that ISRO had tested. So the Indian human space program began more than 10 years ago, because I remember when I moved back to India in 2008, the year after, in 2009, I visited Trivandrum in the south in Kerala to meet the team from ISRO. Um, so ISRO has 17 centers around the country of which there are five big centers. And one of those centers is in Trivandrum and that center focuses on building rockets. So there was a team there uh, that was already starting to work on crew capsules for India. Any country that wants to launch humans into outer space, it takes a good 10, 12, 15 years to get there. So we started back in 2006, I believe, was our first experimental launch. We tested a capsule called SRE-1. And this particular capsule you're looking at the photograph, I think was launched in 2014. It was called CARE, C-A-R-E. And it goes up in one of our rockets. It orbits the Earth about 10, 12 orbits. No, this particular one, I think, was up for 12 days. So it was orbiting the Earth for a few days. And then it comes back. Uh, we, we bring it back with a control re-entry. Otherwise, if it's not a control re-entry, anything would burn up like a meteorite. And then it splashes down in the Bay of Bengal. And this particular one, for example, is a technology demonstrator. They are testing the avionics, the communication stuff, telemetry, and also the tiles that you see, uh, these ceramic tiles, which can withstand very high temperatures during re-entry. So two such capsules have already been tested. And as some of you already know, we are planning to launch Gaganyaan 1 a couple of years from now. But before Gaganyaan 1 is launched, ISRO is planning to do two unmanned launches of the capsule before actually putting a crew of three and launching them on Gaganyaan 1. So that's something exciting that's coming up. We're all looking forward to it. The astronauts have already been through their first round of training in Star City in Moscow. The Institute of Aerospace Medicine in Bangalore 
looks after their physiological and psychological health. Um, ISRO is also building a residential crew um, astronaut training facility in Karnataka outside of Bangalore. So a lot of exciting developments and I'm really looking forward to the first unmanned launch that'll come up possibly in a year or two. This is a beautiful photograph of an iceberg. Uh, so in 2017, uh, I was invited to be part of what was called the Antarctic Biennale. It was an art biennale. It was the first ever cultural expedition to the icy continent. Um, and once again, I thought this is a good connect because the theme for the Odisha Design Week is culturally connected. Um, you know, most of the expeditions to Antarctica are scientific expeditions. And um, even for the International Space Station, there are quite a few of us who have been um, pushing for the need uh, for an art module, you know, where artists can go and do their experiments. Uh, there's no reason why art should not be part of the human foray into outer space. Why should it only be science and technology and, and you know, why not, why not the arts? So this particular expedition, we had 40 artists from around the world uh, who went to Antarctica and we had eight interdisciplinary experts, such as myself. Um, the reason I put this picture here is we all hear about climate change. And I think we are also seeing climate change in our everyday lives. Um, I live in Bangalore these days and the kind of rain we've had this year, uh, it's been continuous and it's been, it's, it's been like cloud dumps, you know, the kind of rain you would expect in a month happens in like 48 hours. So climate change is everywhere and it's more noticeable when you go to the Himalayas or you go to the Alps or uh, you are, you know, you, if you look at Odessa, it these days it has two cyclones a year. Um, so things, climate spikes are becoming more frequent. Um, also, the intensity of these spikes is, is um, a I, at another level. If you look at Canada, for example, I, have, I was talking to a friend a couple of days ago, British Columbia this year had forest fires. It had a tornado. It never had a tornado before. British Columbia is where Vancouver is. And then they also now recently had flooding. And what we in, we in India call cloud bursts in Canada, they're calling them atmospheric rivers. So the evaporation cycles have changed in a way that the clouds hold a lot more water and they just dump it on you causing these enormous floods so this iceberg is to remind you that antarctica is also melting and is starting to melt rapidly just uh, two days ago i was reading in the guardian about one of the biggest glaciers called twitus it's uh, the size of great britain and it's it dumps about 50 billion tons of ice into the ocean every year. And if this particular, so there are five different, five or seven uh, ice shelves in Antarctica, and some of them have already uh, sort of fragmented and broken away and icebergs have melted. Um, so while we were in Antarctica, I remember on one of our landings, we could hear this loud sound as if a skyscraper was being detonated, that level of sound. It was nothing but an iceberg calving. Calving is like breaking away. And when that happens, the glaciers accelerate. So this glacier that I just mentioned, which I read about two days ago, Twitus, it, if all of it melts, you, I just told you it's the size of Great Britain. If all of it melts, then the ocean levels worldwide would go up by 65 centimeters. So it's 35 centimeters short of a meter. So just imagine if all of Antarctica melts, which, you know, a few hundred years down the line, it will. In fact, I should also mention that the Arctic, which is far easier to get to, and um, it's, it's melting at such a fast rate that there are countries around the Arctic which are now starting to include waterways in their, you know, sort of it's, it's because of military interests, strategic interest, mining interests. So a lot of Antarctica will go away in our lifetimes. I think 
in the next seven to ten years. So it's it's quite scary if you think about it. Uh, many of the coastal cities, whether it's Mumbai or San Francisco, um, parts of it will be underwater, and that's a real scenario that's most likely to happen. So I think the message I want to give young people who are listening to this talk is that not only is climate change real, we have reached a point, at least in my view, we've kind of crossed a couple of tipping points already. So you guys need to take your planet back from the likes of us who are who are the reason why, well, us and our ancestors, why you are inheriting a bruised planet and do everything you can to slow down these climatic, this climatic collapse that we are all experiencing now. And I'll end with this picture and a video. So this is a photograph of a concept for a 3D printed Mars base where, so this concept was created by my Vienna company in collaboration with the European Astronaut Center in Cologne. And it was for a Mars competition for 3D printed habitats. It's called Lava Hive. So these parts that you see in sort of a brownish color are 3D printed using Martian regolith. And the other parts have been scavenged from the descent module and whatever else we took to Mars on that particular trip. So in the future, uh, I mean, now we know 3D printing is being used to build small bridges, small houses, large sculptures. So it is even, even tissue, you know, biological stuff. So I think 3D printing will revolutionize the way we design and build um, on other planetary destinations. And I think I will share a video with you guys because I'm hoping there are students and practitioners who would like to see what kind of drawings and renderings go into the making of these habitats. So I'm going to share with you um, a very short video and I'm going to play it to you now. This is the design for a rover that can be used both on Moon and Mars and can carry a crew of up to four astronauts on what we call long distance excursions. In, in our jargon, it's called sorties, S-O-R-T-I-E-S. Thank <laughs> you. 
I think we'll stop the video there so I can take some questions probably. I'm going to stop. Okay, thank you. Wow. Wow. I'm sure, I'm a, sure lot a lot of us, of us are, are saying safe. this, Rashmita. Um, the, the presentation and 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 the work you have done and everything. I mean, it, it's just so amazing. Um, thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. Uh, anybody, any questions? I'm sure we have a lot of things to ask, Sushmita. And uh, uh, I think it's more so because um, a lot of this is uh, an unknown world for many of us. So uh, it, it was really an awe-inspiring uh, presentation. Um, let's uh, see if we have uh, any questions. Any questions from anybody? Amazing insights, yeah, Aryan, yes. I think all of us agree with this. It was a wonderful presentation and a lot of insights. Any question? I think we are all like uh, uh, so much information that, you know, it's it's overwhelming. And I'm sure like uh, Sushmita mentioned, she grew up during uh, the lucky times when people were trusted and not having to be paranoid uh, just to trust other humans. Um, that was great. Um, and then, yeah, we have a question. Uh, yeah, I saw the question. So the question is, where do you get your revenues from? So the way it works is most of our projects are funded either by one of the space agencies uh, where we have to apply, uh, you know, we have to write proposals and bid for contracts in the open. Uh, it's, there's an open tendering system. They will pull, put out a call for tender. So what we would do, for example, the Vienna company, especially in the first seven years, we would mostly bid for contracts with the European Space Agency. And in Europe, the way things are done is usually a consortium. So there'll be a couple of companies, a couple of universities, a couple of research organizations together bidding for a contract um, in an area of interest to that particular space agency. We would also sometimes be invited to be a subcontractor with a bigger company. For example, back then it was called Alenia Spatz, which was the Italian company in Torino. It's a very big space company. They would invite us to be a subcontractor on sub projects because they would be the prime contractor on those projects. Uh, that company is now called Halas Alenia Space. The other way is to apply for grants. So the European Union and the European Commission um, invests almost 70, 80 billion euros every couple of years to promote innovation and research. And that's for several areas and space is one of them. So that's the other place where the Vienna company would apply for grants, again, in a consortium format in partnership with other companies and universities. And we could win anywhere from, you know, a couple of million to three, four million euros. And those kind of projects would normally last for about three years. So none of the things that you saw here are very commercial. So even in the United States, if you see uh, Blue Origin or SpaceX, their, their contracts come from either NASA or DOD, the Department of Defense. So space, even today, is largely funded by taxpayer money, which comes in through the space agency to fund these contracts. So that's, that's how these projects get funded. Um, Sushmita, can you throw light on how design students, for example, we have a student community here from NIDs or uh, many other uh, design institutes, how will they get an opportunity to get exposure to such uh, space uh, related design opportunities? So there is no easy answer, but there is something called the International Space University in France, which has a one year multidisciplinary program where students study 
space life sciences, space law and policy, and also space architecture. Uh, so they, they, they study all these different disciplines related to space. The other uh, thing that some students like to do is go study at the Sasakawa Institute, Institute for Space Architecture in Houston. Hmm. Um, there are also programs like, you know, I did my PhD from Sweden. There is a program at that university in Sweden, which has been, uh, it has been collaborating with NASA Johnson for, I think, a couple of decades now, where they take a class of students, industrial design students, to NASA Johnson for a couple of weeks to see how things are designed, how things are tested, all of that, and sort of do a design studio back in their school at the design school right at the university so that's another way for students to get an exposure um if you are studying in say sept or nid or shishti or what have you uh there are no easy options yet to get that kind of an exposure in india uh, but i think the whole idea here is to be designing for extreme environments so even if you can't design for space you could be designing for the himalayas you could be designing for underwater living you could be designing for, you know, living out in the desert or um, how do you solve the refugee settlements mm -hmm. or how do you make that habitable? So there are many extreme conditions that one could design for even, you know, here within our constraints. But let's hope that once India's space program, the human space program, um, gets going in a few years, maybe, who knows? I mean, ISRO might invite interdisciplinary teams to apply for contracts for designing things for them. But that'll mm -hmm. take some time because we're just getting started with our human space program. Yeah, thanks for that, Molina. I'm sure uh, you got your answer. Uh, we have another question from Priya uh, He asks, uh, to control the climate change, especially in the coastal area, what are the initial things to consider? Yeah, that's a very good question, Priyavrata. So I think you should look at it in two ways. So how do you how do we protect ourselves from water, uh, extreme water conditions, right? Uh, there are several ways to do it. Um, one could be that we plant more coastal trees, like in Orissa, the, the Jhaun Gotcha that we call in Odia, the Jhaun Gotcha cover along the coast, um, a lot of it was taken down during the super cyclone in the late 90s and it continues to be taken down so then the government has to make uh, a fairly aggressive effort to reforest with the right kind of trees that you need along the coast you know to break these uh, tidal waves coming in and and eroding our coast i don't know what the numbers are but even the odisha coast the bangladesh coast is being eroded at a several kilometers you know maybe i i don't know the numbers i'm just giving you a random number here but maybe three or five kilometers of the coast is being eroded every year i'm i'm guessing i don't know the exact numbers another way to deal with these kind of water extremes is we could use satellite imagery uh, you know chennai had floods recently for example and it's a coastal city we could use satellite imagery of, let's say, Chennai, and we could create models using machine learning analytics where you can then predict how the city will inundate when the water fills up in Lake A, B, C and you know, the water bodies. How will the water inundate the city when these water bodies fill up to capacity? So that's modeling. I think modeling can be a very good way of not so much to uh, mitigate, but to respond to these floodings. Uh, another idea could be if you look at cities like Venice, uh, or if you look at countries like the Netherlands, uh, go, go read up on the internet on how they build these dikes, these water dikes. Uh, because a lot of Netherlands is, you know, on, uh, below the sea level. Like you might be sitting at a cafe having coffee and that's like two meters below the sea level. So you can read up on how Netherlands deals with that. And, you know, even smaller places like Venice, which are getting flooded, they've also had to come up with a system of dikes, a sophisticated system of dikes to deal with it. But again, that is more a response than mitigation. I think mitigation, the one best way to do it is plant more coastal trees. Uh, there, there are no shortcuts there. It has to be done. Uh, so I hope I've answered your question, Priyabhata, to some extent. Yes. Um, any more questions? Anybody? Mm. 
No, so 3D printing will not be, it won't be just a 3D, there will be parts of future habitats that will be 3D printed because it's also very expensive to carry things from Earth to the moon or to Mars or to other destinations. But I think what will happen is certain parts of the habitat could potentially be 3D printed in situ using in situ resources. Uh, many of the other parts will have to be carried from Earth and assembled piecemeal. So the answer is, I don't see 100% 3D printed. And by the way, 3D printed habitats research is currently at a stage where we are experimenting with very small, like tile sized, um, you know, 3D printed uh, material using simulated lunar regolith, for example, using lava casting and sintering techniques. So it's still not out of the lab yet, but I think eventually it will, uh, especially if you look at the commercial terrestrial 3D printing, how it's progressed quite a bit in the last 10, 15 years. But again, it, it won't be 100% 3D printed, no. So again, I think in terms of materials, uh, Aryan, it's usually alloys. Um, because alloys, um, certain alloys like titanium alloys and stuff can be very light. They are also inert. When I say inert, uh, what I mean is there is little or no outgassing, you know, um, look up Google the word outgassing. Um, but other than that, we will definitely be experimenting with in situ resource utilization. We call it ISRU, where we take locally available material and we will be working with it through 3D printing. That's going to happen. So it's going to be a combination of alloys um, that we are already using for rocket fairings and you know the space station modules and so on. If you look at the space station module, it's, it's alloys, but it is also a very interesting uh, honeycomb sandwich. So not only is the alloy light, but even structurally you make it strong, but you have a honeycomb, honeycomb structure in between the skin to give it um, uh, sort of the strength properties that you need while keeping it light, because you'll be carrying it on a rocket um, to, to space for assembly. So yeah, I would say between alloys and in situ materials, those, those are going to be, broadly speaking, the two kinds of materials that we'll be using. Uh, I had a short question. I, I, I saw in one of your presentations that you reused parts of an already ex, uh, uh, you used um, uh, space design. I also wanted to know what other steps are we taking uh, as designers to reduce uh, space debris? Uh, because we hear well, about space, that also. Space debris is already as big a problem as climate change. The reason I yeah. say that is in low Earth orbit. So around the Earth, up to about a thousand kilometers, we call it low Earth orbit. So low Earth orbit is very cluttered. We have nearly 350 million man-made debris objects orbiting the Earth as we speak. Uh, debris can be anything uh, like the spent final stages of a rocket. It could be a dead satellite. It could be a solar panel, which we have chucked away. So we have 350 million man-made objects in space orbiting the Earth as we speak. Most of them, about 330 million, are very, very small, like about between one mm and one centimeter. Uh, then we have uh, about a million objects which are between one centimeter and 10 centimeters. And we have around 37,000 objects which are larger than 10 centimeters. So even a small thing like an aspirin tablet um, is moving everything there, whether it's a space station or a tiny piece of junk, they, it's all moving at 28,000 kilometers per hour in low Earth orbit. So enormous speed. So even something as small as say this uh, ring that I'm wearing, if it's, if it's a debris object in space, it could shatter a satellite. Mm -hmm. We often have to move the space station out of the way. So I think just as we have trashed our home planet, we've already uh, cluttered our near earth environment and nobody, those who are actually cluttering it are not even interested in cleaning it up. So the situation is very similar, I would say, to the climate collapse that we are facing here. So there is, in recent years, I have become a sort of a space environmentalist and we are 
trying to fight for enforceable laws to prevent this. Um, and the debris problem is only getting worse because companies like SpaceX, are, are, you know, Starlink is yeah. going to have 42,000 satellites. One, it's problematic because you are also going to be interfering with ground-based astronomy when you have that many shiny objects in low Earth orbit. Mm -hmm. But also each of these satellites will have a lifespan, very short one of maybe two years, two and a half years. So unless uh, SpaceX, SpaceX deorbits the dead satellites immediately after they are dead, they become debris objects too. And for now, the laws that we have uh, are quite silly, if you ask me. They expect or they the laws say that you need to deorbit within 25 years of your satellite going dead, which is a joke. Um, so we don't have any enforceable laws yet. You need consensus. Uh, and you know how difficult consensus can be. So there are some of us out there trying to um, work on that front as well. So there's plenty of debris and it's growing. And the other source of a lot of debris is uh, anti-satellite tests. So the United States, Russia, China, and then India joined the ASAT club uh, in 2019 when we did Mission Shakti, when we launched a missile and just uh, smashed an object in space, you know, to demonstrate our ASAT capability. We created thousands of debris objects. Recently, I think Russia did an ASAT test. So mm -hmm. there are four countries now, including India, that do these ASAT tests for military purposes. And that creates a lot of junk as well. So I think those of you have seen the movie Gravity, it's an exaggeration, but it is something that can actually happen someday. And uh, you, you can have a chain reaction with this debris. Yeah, so Aryan, to answer your question, yes, we could also think of underground habitat on Mars. Uh, but I think Mars has a certain bit of atmosphere. The composition is different. You can look it up. Um, we're not thinking so much of going underground on, on Mars because Mars does have an atmospheric layer. The moon doesn't have one at all which is why uh, anybody, humans who will be spending, you know, doesn't matter, short or long periods of time on the moon, um, which by the way, I think will primarily be miners and construction workers, not so much scientists, if you ask me. Look at some of these good science fiction movies and you'll get an idea. Um, but on Mars, I don't think we really need to go underground as much, Aryan. Great, great insight, Sushmita. Uh, if there are any more questions, then uh, we will uh, go ahead for Sushmita. Otherwise, like Sushmita mentioned, today youngsters are very lucky with the infinite resources online. It just depends on how much and how they are utilized. And just like your advice, utilize your opportunities. And uh, I'm sure, I, I think everybody agrees with me, Sushmita's presentation kind of kindled the dreamers to act now. So very inspiring, Sushmita. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Bye. So everyone, I'm sure you had a great time. Four days. So we will start tomorrow with a photography workshop and then uh, Tanu Sinha will be starting off with our speaker series for tomorrow at two o'clock. Uh, we later have Paul Sandeep and Aniruddha Jha and we will be closing after uh, the prize distribution. Suresh Venkat, a celebrity moderator, will be moderating the session the whole of tomorrow. Do come back tomorrow for the finale and uh, have a great time spent here at Odisha Design Week. Thank you so much for joining today, everyone. You have a great night.